So welcome everybody. Thank you very much for being here. And today our speaker is Lisa Spitzer. After earning her master's degree in psychology from the University of Cologne, Lisa completed her PhD at the Leibniz Institute for Psychology, an open science institute in Germany. Her PhD research primarily centered on pre-registration in psychology with a particular focus on current motivations, obstacles, and the empirical evaluation of pre-registration templates. Additionally, she explored the reproducibility of eye tracking. Through her research, she hopes to contribute to the open science movement and a shift towards greater transparency and reproducibility in scientific practice. So today she will talk to us about motivations and obstacles of pre-registration. Thank you very much, Lisa, for being here. And uh, it's nice to see that uh, so many people are joining and uh, we are really looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm Lisa, nice to meet you all. I'm very happy that you joined today. And uh, yeah, I think I will start by sharing my screen. Okay, um, I'm very excited that today I am able to talk to you about a study I did during my PhD together with my PhD supervisor, Stephanie Müller, um, where we asked psychological researchers about their opinions and experiences regarding pre-registration. And this study was published as a registered report. Um, so you can also take a look at it later on if you want to check out the details. I, will, um, I have included a QR code at the end. Um, yeah, I think uh, we heard enough about me. Uh, a quick remark. I do have two cats, Wilson and Toffee, and um, they might make an appearance later on. I hope that's not a problem for anyone. And um, also, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask anything. Also, if you have some present questions during the presentation, you can also unmute yourself. I'm not sure if I will see your hands up, but you can unmute yourself. And then I think we will also have lots of time later for a discussion. And if you have questions after the um, after the session, you can also reach out via social media or email because I'm very happy to talk about pre-registration with you and also to answer your questions. And a few words about my institute, the Leibniz Institute for Psychology, the ZPIT. Um, this is a public open science institute in Germany. It's focused on um, open science and psychology. And our aim is to support researchers in using open science techniques like pre-registration. So if you have any general questions or you need help with anything, you can also check out our website. We aim to support researchers in all steps of the research cycle. So also if you have any questions about, for example, archiving of your data or, um, I don't know, a publication in open access, um, you can also reach out to us. Okay, so uh, let's start. Um, I wanted to give a short general introduction. I'm not sure how acquainted you all are with pre-registration. So let's first take a closer look at the definition so that we are all on the same page. Um, there is actually not one definition that is supported by everyone, but there has been uh, a definition in the Open Scholarship Glossary, which I worked on together with lots of other authors. Um, this was a community project and they explain in this glossary a lot of open science and open scholarship terms. Um, and here I brought this definition as a work definition for us now. It's still pretty long, so let's take a look at the most important aspects. So a pre-registration means that you write down all the details you have planned for your study. So you basically write a study protocol for your study. And um, this can be done before collecting the data or analyzing the data. So that's often a misconception that it's only possible before data is collected and this is the way it's typically done, but it's also possible to pre-register before analyzing the data, which also makes it possible to do secondary data analyses, pre-registrations, for example. Um, this uh, document is then timestamped. So the date uh, where you publish it is um, also saved within the document and the metadata. And uh, this is registered with an independent party, for example, a repository. Um, so it's not enough to just write the protocol and save it on your local computer, but it's an essential part to also publish it so that um, others can publicly access it. 
So um, it's an important part that it's shared with others. If you are worried about others accessing details of your study before conducting it, it is also possible to use an embargo, which means that the pre-registration is published online, but others can only access it after a specific date that you can set. Um, so if you're worried about that. And all of this then enables a transparent documentation about what was planned as a specific time point and also what changes occurred afterwards for yourself and also for others. And this also makes it possible to distinguish exploratory and confirmatory research. So research based on hypotheses or research based on like exploration of the data. So uh, there are a lot of advantages of pre-registration. And uh, now we can ask ourselves, is it like, is it becoming the norm in psychology or is it like, is it on the rise? There is a uh, kind of conflicting evidence. Um, on the one hand, there are studies that show that when psychologists are asked about pre-registration, they are pretty much in favor or a lot of people say that they use pre-registration. For example, in a study um, published in 2023, um, over 50% of participants um, from psychology answered that they had pre-registered before. Uh, this you can see here on this orange line. And this trend is going upwards, which is also um, visible when expecting, uh, inspecting the number of pre-registrations published in online platforms. But on the other hand, we also have um, evidence that shows that not a lot of articles are actually pre-registered. So this is a study by Hartwig et al, um, where they inspected nearly 200 articles published in psychological literature. And from these um, only 3%, so this little part here, the lighter blue part, was basically pre-registered. Of course, there's kind of a time lag, right? Um, when people use pre-registration, it takes some time for the articles that later to be published, but it's kind of like there are these different uh, kinds of evidence that show that, okay, on the one hand, it is becoming more common, but on the other hand, it's still not used that uh, widely. And so we wanted to conduct our, um, an online survey to investigate possible reasons for this discrepancy and also see um, what are researchers' current attitudes, motivations, and obstacles regarding pre-registration. Um, for our survey, we recruited psychological researchers and students. Um, by scanning their articles on various databases and also some pre-registrations on the OSF and also we recruited via email lists and social media. In the end, we had nearly 500 uh, data sets and of these uh, 289 were complete data sets, which were the um, condition for us to include them in our hypothesis test, which I will also outline later. And in our sample, around 62% of participants had already pre-registered. Um, this is, of course, positive, right? A lot of people indicated they had pre-registered before. At the same time, it could also indicate a sampling bias because we advertised the study as a pre-registration study, right? So people that are in favor of pre-registration might be more willing to participate. Um, we had anticipated this because our study was a registered report and we got a lot of feedback beforehand and we controlled for pre-registration experience in our data analysis. So um, for the sake of completeness, I will uh, present to you our two hypothesis tests, and then I will focus more on the descriptive reports, so the motivations, obstacles, which I think are a very important part of the study. But let's start with the hypothesis tests. So um, our first hypothesis was um, that like our um, question here was um, we wanted to see which factors um, are important for researchers' intention to use pre-registration. We predicted that positive attitudes, uh, subjective norm. So if you think others, um, do you think others are supportive of pre-registration and perceived behavioral control? So you feel like you are capable of doing a pre-registration that all of these positively influence the intention to pre-register. We also thought that the perceived importance of pre-registration was a positive predictor 
and that this would also um, moderate the um, influence of attitudes. And as I mentioned earlier, we included the periodization experience as a control variable. Um, this is based on the theory of plant behavior, a very common theory by Eisen. And um, as you can see here, most of our predictions were actually supported by the data. So in Indeed, uh, attitude, subjective norm, and perceived behavioral control, and also the perceived importance of pre-registration were positive predictors of the intention to pre-register. Um, interestingly, the um, pre-registration experience was not a significant predictor, so it did not make a difference if people had already used pre-registration before. Um, and this is um, yeah, this can be explained because uh, Overall, a lot of people wanted to use pre-registration in the future. I think around 80% of our sample said, yeah, pre-registration is something that I want to do in the future, even people that had not pre-registered before, which I think is a positive outlook. And um, yeah, our second hypothesis was that, um, yeah, um, or focused on the research experience of our sample. Um, we thought that, um, yeah, research experience does have uh, an influence on attitudes, motivations, and obstacles regarding pre-registration, because as you might know, early career researchers, um, as ourselves, are oftentimes seen as the driving force of open science, and for example, pre-registration. So we wanted to test if this is supported by our data. We operationalized research experience by the years someone had already worked in research. And again, we also included pre-registration experience. So if people had used it before as a control variable. Um, and we inspected this, um, these two influences on attitudes, motivations, and obstacles. And um, our results show that research experience was indeed a negative predictor for attitudes and motivations. This means that the less time someone had already worked in research, the better their attitudes and motivations regarding pre-registration were. And um, this fits the assumption that early career researchers, for example, are most supportive of pre-registration, as you can see here. Um, meanwhile, this had no influence on the perception of obstacles. So regardless of the time worked in research, everyone perceived obstacles um, roughly the same. And uh, interesting, interestingly here, pre-registration experience was also a significant predictor. Um, if people had used pre-registration before, um, this was a positive predictor for more positive attitudes and um, higher perception of motivations. And uh, if they had not used pre-registration before, this was um, a predictor for like higher perceived obstacles of pre-registration. So um, based on these results, you could think that Indeed, senior researchers are thinking less positively about pre-registration. Um, but in fact, also in our sample, many senior researchers, for example, professors, had also pre-registered and also thought positively about it. Um, overall, they also supported pre-registration, but I would say that early career researchers even more so. Um, so early career researchers were even more positive about this. Um, we can also uh, see this when we inspect the perceived importance and intention uh, to pre-register. So um, this can be seen in these two plots. Here we see the perceived importance, how important is pre-registration for you, and uh, the intention to pre-register in the future, which was measured with three different items. Um, we can see a scale from minus three, which would be a negative opinion to plus three, a positive opinion. And you can see the different academic groups that we measured, people with bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctoral degree, and habilitation or professorship. And with and without pre-registration experience. So in green, we see people that had pre-registered before, they had very positive um, opinions on the importance of pre-registration and also they fall, um, they had the intention to pre-register in the future. Um, but also people that had not pre-registered before, they thought that pre-registration is important and they wanted to try it out in the future, which you can see by this green box, right? Everything in the green box indicates um, positive opinion because it's above zero in this case. Only professors that had not pre-registered before 
were a bit more reluctant um but um yeah even though they were not like strongly against it uh, many professors were in favor as i mentioned but this was one group that was uh, a little less excited i would say um but i think of all this is a very positive outlook and um, I think another positive outlook was found when we compared the worries of researchers that had not pre-registered before with actual problems experienced by people that had pre-registered before. So we asked people that had not pre-registered before, what worries do you have regarding pre-registration? And if they had pre-registered before, we asked what actual problems did you experience while pre-registering. And this is now one of the descriptive reports. Um, you can see here the worries displayed in uh, this blue color and the problem in this red color. And um, actual problems in red um, were mostly very pragmatic and not very diverse. Um, but meanwhile, worries were indicated much more strongly. So, so you can see a lot of worries were indicated by a high percentage of the sample. And meanwhile, the actual problems were less present, I would say. Um, so for example, the most commonly reported problems indicated by participants were, for example, that it took a lot of time or that they were insecure about what needed to be included in the pre-registration. These were the highest reported problems. And meanwhile, um, regarding the worries, they indicated they were worried about the time costs, um, about low flexibility, loss of credibility due to deviations, that they could not change details about the study or scooping. And I think this can be seen as a very positive outlook because um, the problems were not as present as the worries would indicate. Um, so, um, yeah, I think that... Um, this can be seen as kind of, um, yeah, maybe kind of relief that the problems are not as present at, as people might be worried about. Um, we also found uh, various different motivations uh, when we asked our participants. So they voiced various different benefits and also reasons for them doing pre-registration and for example, reasons why their motivation increased over time for using pre-registration. For example, these included transparency, um, of course, uh, increased trustworthiness of science and also reduced uncertainty about scientific results. Um, they also, and this was the most common reported advantage, um, said that it is very helpful for study planning because um, pre-registration helps to think about the study in detail before conducting the study or analyzing the data. So for example, if you are using a pre-registration template, so a form that helps you create your pre-registration by prompting for different details to report. For example, a template would ask, what are your hypotheses? What variables do you want to measure? How do you want to measure them? How do you want to analyze them? And some of these templates are very detailed. And this is very helpful for uh, planning in advance, right? Because you have to think about all the details very deeply in advance. Um, and also this is um, like a personal experience for my PhD. I think it's also very helpful um, when working together with collaborators. Or for example, when I um, did my studies in my PhD and I worked together with my PhD supervisor, I found it very helpful because I could write the pre-registration and then I could send it to her and she could comment and give suggestions. I could rework the pre-registration before uploading the final version. And then once we both were happy with the pre-registration, we could then upload it. And um, this would mean that we had agreed on one plan. Um, I have actually never done a study without a pre-registration in my PhD, but I think like normally you have these kind of notes and they might not be at the same place, uh, place all the time. And maybe in meetings you would think that you are agreeing on one specific plan, but there might be misconce uh, misconceptions or mis uh, misunderstandings. And I think having this one document that everyone read and agreed on is very helpful. Um, 
yeah that is like a personal uh experience um people also said that they felt that pre-registration is becoming the norm and that is a motivation for them to use pre-registration and also that uh, they felt it improved their study structure at the same time however we also um, were able to identify a number of barriers or obstacles of re uh, pre-registration that currently hinder people in using pre-registration. And uh, I think it's very important to address these in the future. And this was my main reason for um, conducting the study, because I think it's very important to see, OK, there are a lot of advantages to pre-registration, but at the same time, if there are obstacles and people are insecure and then they don't want to use it, we need to address these to facilitate or foster pre-registration. For example, the um, obstacle that was named uh, the, the most frequent was effort and time. Um, people were also worried about um, limited flexibility. Um, they also reported, this was very common, a lack of knowledge. So they were just insecure of how to do it. Um, and they felt like they didn't know about uh, enough about pre-registration. Um, people were also worried about the evaluation of air exploratory research um, or of scooping, which means that other people could steal your study idea because it is available online and they could take it and then do the study faster than you. This is scooping and people are worried about that. Um, and the inadequate uh, handling of deviations. Um, for all of these, we discuss uh, solutions in our registered report. For example, regarding effort and time, I think it's very important to make clear that the effort someone puts in their pre-registration is not lost, but will be it will be helpful later on. So um, pre-registration basically means that you have to spend more work beforehand, but then later on, um, during data analysis, for example, you have this checklist that you can just uh, use and go step for step and then um, everything is already laid out for you and you don't have to um, work that hard later on during that process. And also this um, decreases the risk of biases, for example. And um, I think the lack of knowledge is a very prominent problem and that that we can also easily address, right, by, for example, giving workshops or hosting journal clubs like this one. So I think this is also a very nice solution and to like get into contact with pre-registration. Um, and yeah, uh, for example, scooping, researchers worry about scooping. Um, I think there's also a very simple solution for that. They could just use an embargo, as I mentioned earlier. You can just say, okay, the pre-registration is saved online but no one can access it until a date in the future that I can set. And um, yeah, I think um, for all of these, um, we discussed solutions in detail if you want to check them out in the registered report. Um, one personal uh, like passion topic of mine is the dealing with deviations. I think this is one of the biggest issues with free registration right now, because as you can see here, on the left side, we asked our participants, um, when you read a paper describing a study that was pre-registered, do you read the corresponding pre-registration? And you can also um, maybe think about if you are reading uh, an article, do you check out the pre-registration? I would be interested in that later on in the discussion maybe. And um, we had some people that said, oh, I always read the pre-registration or most of the time, but most of the sample rarely uh, read the pre-registration, some never. And uh, interestingly, some people even said they can't recall ever reading a paper that was pre-registered. Um, mostly people that had not pre-registered before. Um, I thought that was very interesting. But um, I think the bottom line is that people usually don't read the pre-registration. And I get it, right? It is a lot of work to read an article. We don't have that much time. And it is a lot of work to also read the pre-registration and to, um, to compare both. I actually did a study where I um, recently where I compared pre-registration and article. And it is tedious work. It takes a lot of time. And uh, of course, the readers don't do it. 
but the editors and the reviewers also typically don't do it. So pre-registrations are not typically checked right now. And um, at the same time, people report being afraid um, like how to report deviations. So they reported inadequate handling of deviations. Um, they are unsure how to report them um, or if to report them. Um, and then um, what can happen is that they pre-register, they deviate from the pre-register plan, but they are not sure how to report the deviations. And then they just don't do it because the pre-registration is online. People could check it, right? Um, but they don't. And then this can create a false sense of confidence in the pre-registered study's results if uh, people think that everything was done as pre-registered but it wasn't, it just wasn't reported. And I think it's very, very important to highlight that deviations are no problem at all. Um, I think this is one of the biggest insecurities regarding deviations. People um, I talk to oftentimes still have the misconception that you you mustn't, you, it's not possible to deviate from the pre-registration. You have to stick to the pre-registration 100%, but that's not true. Um, it's only important to um, report transparently um, where you deviated so that it's uh, very clear how to interpret the results. And um, I actually did a hackathon at this year's uh, SIPS, which is an open science conference in Africa uh, this year. And um, I asked people that I, like the the um or it was an unconference like a discussion round, and um I asked the participants if they had any problems um when they deviated with publishing the article, and um they all said um it was not a problem uh, when I reported the deviations, only if like uh you don't report them and then the editor sees oh there are deviations that are not reported that can be like not so nice but when you report the deviations, no one had a problem. Um, so I think this is a very, very um, big issue and uh, something that we need to address. And the important thing here is also that journals need to inspect pre-registrations, right? There's a lot of unused potential here uh, when pre-registrations are not checked. And uh, yeah, this is a reason why I also like registered reports. We can also talk about this uh, later on if you're interested. Um, so here in registered reports, you basically submit the first half of your article introduction and methods, and this gets reviewed by the journal or by reviewers, and you get feedback on that. And then um, it's very clear that everything is reviewed before uh, because it's part of the submission process. Um, yeah, this is a kind of a passion topic of mine. <laughs> And um, yeah, we also asked participants for suggestions to increase researchers' motivations to pre-register or to decrease obstacles and um, overall to improve the pre-registration process. And we, um, a lot of the time in our study, we um, did qualitative analysis, which was a lot of uh, work, but we asked them in an open text format and then we coded like common themes. And the proposed solutions um, match quite well with what we had found with the quantitative analyses. So to decrease obstacles, people mainly suggested providing better education. And I think this is really, really important because it's very overwhelming. If you want to do a pre-registration and you just start Googling it, there are a lot of materials, but it's very difficult to find the first, like to do the first step. And so I think it's very important to bring it into the university or do workshops or just talk about it and point people to the right resources. Um, they also mentioned that it's important to um, put off pressure of researchers that use pre-registration by destigmatized deviations. Um, stigmatizing deviations, so um, as I mentioned earlier, make very clear that deviations are not a problem. You only need to report them transparently. Um, and then also providing accessible and clear templates. So as I mentioned, these forms that help um, you to create a pre-registration by um, like outlining what information is important. And I think this is very helpful if you don't have like an empty 
page before you, but you have these questions. And it was also um, also shown that uh, very detailed pre-registration templates can uh, help to um, write effective pre-registrations. This is another study I um, I'm currently working on. Um, and to increase motivations, people uh, suggested providing better incentives. I think this is like, um, we have been talking uh, for a long time about that, right? It's very important to work on the incentive structure in academia because it's oftentimes this publish or perish uh, culture where you have to publish and um, it's very important to, for example, as with registered reports, provide incentives for pre-registration uh, with registered reports, you will get this security if the first part is accepted and you, you then do the study, then it's um, published regardless of the results. You have the security that the study is then later published. Um, they again, to increase motivation, um, mentioned education. I think this is the most important thing. And uh, some people also indicated that they would think it's helpful to make pre registration obligatory. Um, yeah, I think there are advantages and disadvantages to that, right? Um, we can talk about that later if you're interested. Um, and yeah, these are the main results of this study. So uh, thanks a lot for listening. Um, I'm always really happy to talk about pre-registration. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. And um, here on this slide, you can see the QR code to find our registered report, also my contact information. And I would like to thank my PhD supervisor and co-author Stephanie Miller. Thanks a lot.